with basic English and good people skills, to work flexible hours in central locations. Applicants between three and six years old especially welcome. A Panorama special investigates the families behind Britain's child beggars, Wednesday at 9 on BBC One. Now on BBC Two and the BBC HD channel, you wouldn't think something like this could ever happen, but for thousands of parents across Spain, their worst nightmare came true. Spain is reeling from an avalanche of shocking allegations of baby theft and baby trafficking, recently revealed to have gone on for decades. Graves are being exhumed, their contents exposing the cynical deceits used to trade in human life. Why was she so cold? She was completely frozen. Since the Spanish Civil War, hundreds of thousands of babies are believed to have been trafficked by nuns, priests and doctors. I've been meeting the heartbroken mothers, now searching for the children they'd been told had died at birth. Yeah. I'm convinced they didn't bury my baby. I have always doubted the boy died. He's alive in my heart and the stolen and trafficked babies, now grown up, who are searching for their biological families and their true identity. We want to know the truth. I want her to be honest, and I want her to tell me who our mothers are. While there's hope of emotional reunions for some, the victims are reeling, asking themselves the most fundamental of questions. Where, where do you come from? Are you completely Spanish? Are you half Spanish? Are you even Spanish? Whoa. What are you? Madrid housewife Manoli Pagador has three daughters and lots of grandchildren. But she's never got over the loss of her firstborn, a son, nearly 30 years ago. When they first told me he died, for me, that was the worst thing on earth. My world collapsed. From that moment on, I no longer existed. In April 1971, Manoli gave birth to a seemingly healthy baby boy in the O'Donnell Hospital in Madrid. The birth had to go well, with no complications. But it's the horror of what happened next that's haunted Manoli ever since. I said, aren't you going to give him to me? No, they said. No, no. We need to take him down to see the doctor. At first I heard a baby crying. However, that crying went away. It went further and further away. And then, nine hours later, a nun arrived and she just said, your baby's died. Manoli and her husband never believed their baby died. Like many other parents across Spain with striking similar stories, they believe their child was stolen. I have always doubted the boy died. He's alive in my heart. Until recently, some members of Manoli's own family doubted her. But her eldest daughter, Ma, now believes passionately that her brother was stolen, and she's turned detective in an effort to find out the truth. My mother has told me her story many times. How she had her baby and how they treated her. I feel so much anger, so much. 
Right now, I'm living in a bubble and looking for my brother. I think it will be us victims who will do the investigation. I can tell you that now. Recent events in Spain have given Manoli and Mar, and thousands like them, new hope. In January this year, hundreds of Spaniards who believe they were the victims of mass baby trafficking launched a campaign demanding a national investigation. They alleged a trade involving many thousands of Spanish infants, including cases of organized baby theft. The volume and similarity of their stories shocked the country. The campaign was spearheaded by Antonio Barroso. Antonio Barroso and his childhood friend Juan Luis Moreno grew up in a small seaside town near Barcelona. Just recently, they discovered they were both victims of child trafficking, and they're now reassessing their lives. That is the flat where I lived. That's my room, the one at the top. It was only when visiting his father on his deathbed that Juan Luis finally found out the truth. He said, I bought you. That's engraved here in my mind and in my heart, you know? I bought you from a priest here in Zaragoza. And he said that Antonio had been bought as well. And I asked my dad, how much did you pay for 150,000 pesetas. I cost the same as that flat. Juan Luis then took a DNA test to see if his DNA matched that of the woman he'd called mother all his life. Probability of maternity, 0.000%. I've been lied to, I've been conned. Juan Luis and Antonio's parents weren't friends before they bought their sons. But after doing so, they often spent the weekend together, sharing a guilty secret. Well, it's like someone who buys two dogs. Two friends that bought dogs and decided to go together for a walk with them. It was a false love. Every day I'm more sure of it. Most of Spain's trafficked children have no idea who their real mothers are. Some were stolen from their parents, others given up, either willingly or not, by unmarried mothers who were stigmatized in Catholic, conservative Spain. Juan Luis is haunted by the idea he may have been taken from his real mother against her will. To think that there is a mother out there in Spain or Europe or somewhere in the world, the baby was stolen and we could be her sons. Gosh, it's very hard. Juan Luis and Antonio believe they were stolen rather than given away by their mothers. But it's a difficult thing to prove as their birth documents are riddled with false information. Since Juan Luis and Antonio launched their campaign, thousands of Spaniards who believe they too are victims have come forward. I've come to one of the many road shows set up by support groups across Spain. They're attempting to match the DNA samples of those desperate to find their blood relatives. Lawyers estimate that as many as 300,000 children were trafficked in Spain. Parents are searching for their children, and children searching for their parents. Two days after giving birth, the birth was fine. I showed her to my husband. Nobody said she wasn't healthy. Two days later, they came and told me that she died. Something must have happened. 
I think they stole her from me. Many of the people here say they were refused permission to see their baby, even after they were told it had died. They isolated us completely. My wife was told she couldn't see him because she could get a hemorrhage. Why can't I see my son, even if he's dead? I didn't see him. It was my dream to have a son, and now you think some other people are enjoying this child instead of me. I feel so powerless. All I can do is cry. Some of the families who believe their babies were stolen have private investigations. And shocking evidence has emerged. Babies' graves are now being exhumed across Spain, making for some disturbing discoveries. One baby's grave had just a pile of stones in it, another only the remains of an adult leg, while the grave of a baby girl showed the bones of a baby boy, no relative at all of the distraught parents. Spaniards are appalled, and as public pressure mounts and the evidence of wrongdoing increases, there are likely to be many more exhumations in the coming months. While most of the exhumations have been done privately, a judge in southern Spain has now ordered the first state exhumations. The Spanish government has appointed a national coordinator to oversee the issue Spaniards call Niños Robados, Spain's stolen children. Without a doubt. Many? I don't try to come up with a figure myself, but from the volume of official investigations, I would dare say yes, there were many. This is a really serious matter. When it affects something as essential as your own identity, your right to know your origins, these are fundamental rights. Spain's judicial system is now examining cases which took place between 1960 and 1990. But the origins of this tragedy are older and ideological. The longer you live here, the more you notice the huge shadows of the past that haunt Spanish society today. It's a legacy of 40 years of military dictatorship which only ended relatively recently. There's been a reluctance in Spain to rake over that past and so to come to terms with it. And that means that deep-seated divisions and a sense of injustice still exists in Spain today. In 1939, General Franco's fascists seized power at the end of Spain's long and bloody civil war. Franco immediately began a military dictatorship over a country that was economically devastated and bitterly divided along political lines. Franco's presence still looms over Spain today. His body lies in this haunting mausoleum, built for him by his enslaved enemies, known as the Valley of the Fallen. He said, we are going to create a totalitarian state that has no turning back. Anyone who steps out of line is eliminated, either physically or socially. Of course, this was all firmly supported by the Catholic Church. They were the two pillars. Franco ordered the elimination of his enemies, the anti-fascists dubbed the Reds. Thousands were executed or imprisoned. Their children were placed with right-wing Catholic families or put into institutions run by the clergy and brainwashed with the fascist doctrine. Eugenio Alvarez was one of those Red children. His mother died whilst under interrogation and his father was later executed. Eugenio was sent to a children's home in northern Spain, where he was brought up by nuns. The flag of the Franco regime was always hanging there. We were all singing with our arms outstretched. Hi. 
Lo siento lleno. Lo siento lleno, lo siento mucho. They killed me in 1936. Thousands and thousands of children. They destroyed us. It's estimated that between 30 and 40,000 Spanish children were orphaned or simply removed from their parents and handed over to institutions or families that would give them an ideologically preferable upbringing. To seal the fate of the children of his enemies, Franco personally enacted a new adoption law in 1941. It made it legal to name the adoptive parents as a child's biological parents on their birth certificate. Infants grew up unaware that they were adopted unless anyone told them otherwise. This deceit laid the foundation for the mass trafficking of babies that was to follow for the next 50 years, long after the fascists had lost power. While Spanish society continues to be rocked by the scandal, reverberations have been felt around the world. Randy Ryder lives in Texas, but he was born in Spain in the 1970s. He had a difficult childhood, living between an unstable Austrian mother and an often absent Texan father. The first half of my life, uh, I spent with my mother. She was an alcoholic. When she would drink, she would always talk about a woman from Spain. She would just say that you're not really mine and that um, I um, got you from this very bad woman in Spain. Um, but I always sort of wrote that off as just being gibberish. It was only by accident that Randy began to find out the truth. He was holidaying with his own son at his grandmother's home in Austria when he made a remark about his child's lack of family evidence. I said, you know, Grandma, he doesn't look a lot like us, does he? He doesn't have a lot of our features. <clears throat> and at that point, you know, my grandma was already in her 80s, and um, she looks at me and she just says, well, you don't, that's when she said, you don't have my blood. I said, I, what are you talking about? And she said, you're not, you're, you're not part of, biologically, you're not part of my blood, my family. And at that point, my aunt got up and rushed her into the other, into the house, and everybody started cleaning up the dishes, and um, I almost fell out of the chair. When Randy confronted his father about what his grandmother had said, in the end, his father admitted he'd been bored. He finally said, OK, you are, but I want you to know that we picked the best one out of the bunch. He even told me that he, you know, provided like $5,000 to pay for the birth. But births didn't cost $5,000 back then. I would say that a large percentage of that cash went to someone. That's equivalent to £16,000 in today's money. Randy requested his birth certificate from the Spanish consulate. He was surprised that the people he now knows were not his mother and father, were listed as his biological parents. There was no indication of a person being adopted. The combination of Franco's adoption law and falsehoods in documents has left victims like Randy few clues as to their real identity. The families of those who believe their baby was stolen have also been following the paper trail. But years after the event, it's not easy. In Madrid, Manoli's eldest daughter, Ma, has been leading the search for the man she believes to be her stolen brother. I started to ask for documentation and saw that nothing matched up. I sought information from a doctor, from forensics, and what the documents tell me is not real. It is a lie. In one document, it says the baby died from an intracranial hemorrhage nine hours after birth, while in another, it states the baby failed to draw breath and was stillborn. This is Almudena Cemetery, which, according to documents Manoli now has, 
is where her son was buried. She's visiting the spot for the very first time. I think it was number 56, third grave. It's a strange feeling, but I'm convinced they didn't bury my baby. Something tells me. After the birth, Manoli wasn't well enough to attend her baby's burial, but her husband was determined to. My husband wanted to attend his son's burial, of course, and they said no, that they'd take care of it. They would do everything. Being refused access to the funeral of their dead baby is a recurrent story with Spanish mothers who believe their infants were stolen. During Franco's rule and the years that followed, ordinary Spaniards were powerless in the face of authority. Mothers didn't dare argue with hospital staff. Strangely, Manoli's son's burial documents suggest his funeral was a rather elaborate affair. Everything's on record as paid for, as if it were our burial. The flowers, the priest, everything. The small coffin, as if we'd paid for it. It didn't exist. The car didn't exist. The priest didn't exist. Nothing existed. I don't think they buried the baby. After finding out where her son was supposedly buried, Manoli was then told that any remains had been moved to a mass grave to make space for more burials. This means she can no longer carry out an exhumation for DNA testing. Many of the wrongs associated with the Franco regime were laid to rest along with the dictator. After Franco's death in 1975, the major political parties agreed an amnesty to help smooth the transition to democracy. But this amnesty law has never been repealed. So attempts to investigate Spain's baby trafficking as a national crime against humanity have been rejected by the country's judiciary. Critics argue this is evidence of the undying influence of Francoism in modern-day Spain. In Spain, there are hundreds of thousands of people that yearn for the past and who think that the past can't be cured. Here, we haven't cured Franquismo, and in certain aspects, we're exactly the same as before. Socially, this country carries a lot of lead on its wings. It's weighed down, and as long as that's there, the doves will not fly. With no national case, Spain's attorney general has charged regional prosecutors with investigating individual cases, more than 900 to date. I think 35 years have passed since the death of the dictator. We have a professional and independent justice system. Evidently, we still have problems from the past, social problems, but also personal and even cultural problems. And the policy of this government has been one of trying to solve them. Meanwhile, Ma's own investigation is progressing. She's discovered a 39-year-old man she believes may be her stolen brother. He doesn't speak any Spanish, and Ma doesn't speak any English. So they're going to chat using an internet translator. Sounds simple. Hola. Hello. There's a lot of deeper intellectual stuff I think both of us would like to share with each other, but it's impossible in this medium. You really can't express yourself on these things. Ma was watching one of the numerous TV programs dedicated to helping victims search for their biological relatives. She spotted an immediate family resemblance in one of the characters. I saw him on television. I thought, oh, this guy looks a lot like my father. 
I was a nervous wreck. After thinking for 40 years that my brother had died, I now find out that he could still be alive. Mars clearly captivated by the idea of Randy being her older brother. But Randy is rather more cautious. I've questioned a lot where she's been much more sort of blindly open to the idea that we're related. And I'll bring up small points of differences such as me being born in Malaga and her brother being born in Madrid and what's the likelihood of the baby having been transported to the south. The likelihood may be higher than Randy realizes. Many victims are now discovering they were moved around the country. Buenas noches. Efectivamente, esa es la pregunta. ¿Se sentarán alguna vez en el banquillo los responsables de este gran escándalo? The trafficking scandal has become something of a national obsession, with dozens of hours of television devoted to it, shining an uncomfortable light on the role of the church. Lo peor de todo, que hace muy poquitos meses enterado de que había una monja que es la que cogía los sobres y distribuía el dinero. Que a mí tampoco me cuadra, como es lógico. Y me cuesta mucho aceptar que una monja, una religiosa, un, de un cura dudo incluso. Pero padre, y que hay, y que hay ¿alguno, ¿algún humano malo puede haber? A ver, más de bueno, 3 millones de a ver euros, el debate no es la iglesia. Under Franco, the church assumed a prominent role in main social services, including hospitals, schools, and children's homes. Individual nuns and priests were ideally placed to organize the trafficking of babies, sourcing them from mothers they regarded as less suitable than the parents on their adoption waiting lists. Eager to follow any lead that may help them find their reasons, Juan Luis and Antonio are going to the town of Zaragoza to find out what they can from a nun involved in their sale. Discovering these things is very hard. And worst of all is the fact that the church was involved. I didn't trust the church before, but now I see it as public enemy number one. As boys, Juan Luis and Antonio holidayed here every summer for a number of years. But for Juan Luis, this trip down memory lane has stirred mixed emotions. On the one hand, I remember it fondly because it meant the holidays were starting. But on the other hand, it's a sad memory because now I understand why we came here to pay the instalments for the baby, the baby that had been stolen. While Juan Luis and Antonio stayed with their mothers, playing amongst the pigeons, their fathers were to pay their respects and to pay off their debt. My father told me that they would give the money to a priest who would come out from behind here. And according to what Antonio's mother told him recently, it was one of the nuns who collected and distributed the money. Is that the nun we're going to see? Yes, that's the nun we're going to see. While Juan Luis and Antonio are hoping the nun will reveal who their biological families are, Ma and are putting their trust in science. For most victims of the scandal, the only way to prove beyond doubt a family connection is to see if DNA samples match.
que para mí, vamos, encontrar a mi hijo sería... Finding my son would be the greatest thing on earth. I used to say to my daughter that it was impossible. And she'd say, yes, find him, Mum. We'll find him. And now with this guy, it seems more achievable. But of course, it could be a huge disappointment. Across the other side of the world, in Texas, Randy is also giving a DNA sample. I'm losing sleep about the possibility that Randy could be my brother. Sea mi hermano. I feel bad because it was me who contacted Randy and stirred up the family's emotions. I guess we'll do the first one. I mean, if it was him, well, I don't believe in God, but I would believe in miracles. After giving his DNA sample, Randy will fly to Madrid to finally meet Ma and Manoli. They plan to collect their DNA results together. It's early days, but a handful of DNA matches have been made between stolen babies and mothers who were told their child had died. It's concrete proof that for decades, Spanish babies were forcibly taken and then sold on. There are numerous support groups, blogs and websites where victims level allegations at individual doctors, hospitals and private clinics. The most notorious of these is the San Ramon Clinic in Madrid, which was under the clinical direction of Dr. Eduardo Vella Vella, described as being ultra-Catholic. Dr. Vella has been accused of running a baby factory, providing babies on demand to selected families. Ines Perez was a childless, devoutly Catholic married woman in her late 40s, who received the ultimate gift from Dr. Vella, a daughter also called Ines. Ines Senior had fostered two boys as a favor for her local priest, childhood friend of Dr. Vella's. Dr. Vella was asked if he could provide Ines with her own baby as a special thank you. Dr. Vela agreed and asked Inez to fake a pregnancy before being given the child. This man said to me, are you willing to pretend that you are pregnant? I said, yes. Then I had to put on the padding as if I were really pregnant. And he shaped what he had put on me the padding on the front. Everything was signed by him. The doctor did it at the time of birth. That document led to the baby being registered officially as Ines Senior's biological child. The truth would never be known. It's very painful for me to think that I could have a whole family in another place that loves me, that have been looking for me all this time. I feel repulsion. I would like him to feel at least once a modicum of the pain that he has inflicted on countless families. Hundreds of babies are now believed to have been trafficked from the San Ramon Clinic. It was well known to be the place to go if you wanted a baby fast and had the means to pay for it. Lali Carrasco was one such woman. Hola, Hola. Lali. Katia. Vamos a mi casa, pero yo pensé es muy, más yeah. lo más privado, porque ah, tú bien. querías sí, quedar sí, privada, sí, ¿no? Sí, he querido... Sí. 
after waiting a year on Madrid's official adoption waiting list, Ali Carrasco and her husband were told they could get a baby quickly if they visited a nun, Sister Maria, who worked closely with Dr. Vela. In return for the baby, Lali and her husband provided both Sister Maria and Dr. Vela with payments in cash. I think it was around 50,000 pesetas to Sister Maria and around 120,000 to Dr. Vela. Dr. Vela. But I thought these were normal expenses of the clinic and for the mother's stay at the residency. This official receipt for birth expenses from San Ramon Clinic shows the going rate at the time was around 27,000 pesetas. Lali and her husband were asked to pay more than five times as much to Sister Maria and Dr. Vela. But where were the babies coming from? In 1981, civil registry sources indicate that 70% of women who gave birth at the San Ramon Clinic were registered as mother unknown. This was totally legal under Spanish law and was meant to protect the anonymity of unmarried mothers. But it was also widely used to cover up baby trafficking. Photojournalist Germán Gallego was working for Interview magazine in 1982 when they received a tip-off about unmarried mothers being coerced into giving up their babies for trafficking. There was a Dr. Vela who ran the clinic. We tried to speak to him so he could tell us what was going on, but he absolutely refused to speak to us. However, some of the nurses there wanted to talk to us. So they told us things like people would arrive to give birth and that another person would arrive and wait in a different room and then that person would end up taking the baby. At one point during the interview, they told us that when women wanted to keep their baby, they were then told that their baby had been born dead. So I said, don't they want to see it? And they said, yes but we keep several babies in the freezer. German then arranged to return to San Ramon Clinic in the dead of night to see for himself. Nurse opened the door and we went through to a back room. And they opened the door to a freezer and they showed me a child, a baby girl, that had been stillborn but they kept her as a model to show people. It was horrible. Interview magazine ran with Germán's shocking pictures and allegations of child trafficking at San Ramon. They were expecting a bombshell, perhaps the start of a police inquiry, but nothing came of it. The only thing that happened was a phone call from the police inquiring about it and they said they were going to investigate it, but they didn't investigate anything. We gave them all the information we had on Dr. Vela and the people, the nun there, and nothing happened to any of them. At the time, we were a doctor in Spain during the 80s. It was like you were God. I've come to Tenerife to see a woman who believes her baby was stolen by Dr. Vela in the early 1980s. Her story is disturbingly similar to many women who say their child was taken from them at San Ramon. Hola, soy Katia. Encantada. Dr. Vela had sedated Elsa Lopez when she gave birth. When she came round, he was at her side with some terrible news. Dr. Vela, 
me dice... Dr. Werner told me that the birth had been complicated, that the baby was having difficulties and she was not very well, and he wasn't sure that she'd survive. I started to cry and he told me, don't cry, because I'm going to baptize her so that she'll go to heaven with the angels. And then he came back with that thing, wrapped in a towel or a cloth or something, all wrapped up. So he brought the baby close to me. It was very pale. He said, give her a kiss. So I kissed her. Why was she so cold? She was completely frozen. Shortly after, Dr. Vela returned, this time without the baby. He stroked me and told me, don't cry. God has taken a him. It's better this way, because a child with health problems, with disfigurements, would have been a burden. Elsa went on to have more children, but she never believed her baby really died. To add to her doubt, Elsa's documents registering her baby's birth and death are riddled with inaccuracies. In January 1977, Elsa had had a miscarriage and was treated at the San Ramon Clinic. Now, in February 1981, the medical certificate for her supposedly dead baby appears to be a crude forgery based on the documents from her miscarriage. To the lawyers, this just seems illogical. It's an evident forgery of information. And Elsa is convinced that she knows why she was targeted to have her baby taken. I probably didn't fit the right profile for Dr. Vela. At the time, I was a divorced with a child outside marriage and with a much younger man. I don't believe in God. I'm a politically incorrect person because I'm a woman of the left. Everybody knows this. I work with left-wing political movements, feminist movements in Madrid. And he knew all this. Elsa is not the only mother who believes she was shown a frozen baby by Dr. Vela as part of an elaborate deceit. Dr. Vela was able to run a baby factory for decades, producing babies to order without being held to account for it ever. We've asked him for an interview, but he declined, as he has declined any such request for an interview over the last 30 years. Now, by some strange coincidence, I gave birth in Dr. Vela's latest clinic, Clinica Belen, here in Madrid, over a year ago now. And that's how I've managed to get an appointment to see him today, as a newly expectant mum. Dr. Vela immediately assumed I was talking about the allegations of stolen babies. Que yo he vendido niños, he comprado niños, demás, no, ni uno por descontado. Si no, no estaría aquí, no estaría trabajando. ¿eh? Dr. Vela explained he was providing a service for women who didn't want or couldn't keep their baby. Y, pero lo que no quería y quería tener el niño, pues había una ley de adopción que es la que se aplicaba. Y no hice más que atender a esas mujeres cumpliendo enteramente la ley. Aquí me ponen una coletilla de acuerdo si la madre que no quiera dar un nombre, póngase desconocida. Se pone desconocida. Pero dicen cosas muy raras que era para demostrar a mujeres, es decir, que está este niño congelado. Es que son historias un poco como una historia de, de historias horror. Historias periodísticas nada más. Nada más. El niño estaba en un congelador sí, y que se metieron es. los de interview. 
Bueno, pero eso no fue más que un feto, uno. Pero es que no hay más que uno. Ese es un niño que yo tenía que hacer autopsia. La autopsia, la entrada... Dr. Vela then became suspicious. De interview. Tú no serás periodista, Katia. No, es que soy los dos. Soy madre y también soy periodista. Soy periodista de la, de la BBC. Me vienes engañando. No, Katia, no. No quiero saber más de periodistas. A mí nunca me han denunciado un policía y no he estado nunca en la cárcel ni he tenido ningún juicio estoy totalmente libre con eso basta muy sencillo sí madres que dicen que Dr Vela had clearly had enough of my questions and headed for the door pero no es posible pero hay hay todas estas preguntas o when he returned he was brandishing a cross and began quoting sections from the Bible in order to lambast the profession of journalism. Fíjate lo que he hecho, lo que me ha agarrado, ¿eh? Fíjate a lo que me ha agarrado. No. Una vez lanzada, continúa viviendo por inercia durante alguna durante algún tiempo, porque hay quien escribe sin informarse. Hay quien escribe sin informarse los periodistas. Dr. Vela denies any wrongdoing. He still claims he was storing the baby in the freezer to carry out an autopsy. Medical experts we've spoken to say this story makes no sense and would have clearly been in contravention of Spanish autopsy law at the time. The children adopted through the San Ramon clinic have little chance of finding their birth mothers, as Dr. Vela claims he personally burned all the files. Their only hope now is DNA matching. Manoli Pagador and her daughter Ma have come to Madrid airport to meet Randy, who's arriving from Texas. Tomorrow, they go together to get the results of their DNA tests to find out if they are actually related. I'm nervous and excited. I'm happy because I'm going to meet him in person. Just talking about it makes my heart race. Ay, qué guapo mi niño. Oh, Randy, qué guapo cariño. ¿Qué tal? Hi, how are you? Ay, mi madre pobre. ¿No te entiende? They waste no time introducing Randy to what might be his new Spanish family. Ah, gracias. Hola, Miguel. Wow. Todas las tres. Amigos. Lo veo muy majo. Muy majo. I think he's lovely. Really lovely. He'd be the perfect son if he were my own. A part of me says he could be. But another part of me is staying grounded and says it might not be. But I keep on dreaming. I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I'm scared. I mean, with Mar, it's, it's interesting because I feel a connection with her. And it felt very comfortable to hug her. We've been speaking for so long over the internet that I do feel a connection to her. Um, you know, I just don't know anyone else. And I'm really frustrated that I can't communicate with anybody directly. In Zaragoza, Antonio and Juan Luis are preparing to visit Sister Asuncion Vivas a bedridden nun in her 80s. She's the only living person who might know who their mothers are. Bueno. 
Juan Luis, que tenga suerte y a ver si te sale si la te acompaño hasta la esquina. I want her to realize she committed an offense and we want to hear it from her. We want to know the truth. I want her to be honest and I want her to tell me who our mothers are. Juan Luis begins by asking the nun what she can remember about payments. The sister admits she was involved in handling payments. But Juan Luis is more interested in finding out the identity of his real mother. The nun insisted Juan Luis and Antonio's mothers were unmarried and so seen as sinners in conservative Spain. She said she saved them from being aborted but she gave no hint as to their mother's names. Another visit, another disappointment. Every time I come here, she gives a little bit more information, but she gives you just enough to leave you in the lurch. Every Spanish person has the right to know their origins. And as such, I hold on to this right in the Constitution, and I demand it. I want the Spanish government to tell me where I come from. Lots of people are implicated, the church, judges, hospitals, there's a whole network. But what I'm seeing in these last few days is that this is too big. I think it's too big for Spain or for the governing people in Spain. The Catholic Church refuses to comment on its role in Spain's stolen and trafficked baby scandal. While cases are investigated one by one, there's little doubt that the victims will find justice hard to come by. And, unlike other countries with stolen baby scandals, to a military dictatorship like Argentina or Chile, Spain has never created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to help victims deal with the crimes of the past. Do you think there will be justice for the victims of child theft? I doubt it very much. Franquismo is a cancer that was in power for 40 years. And that cancer can't just be cured with an aspirin called transition. That cancer is still there. And as long as it's not removed, it'll carry on gestating inside. Spanish society knew this was happening and looked the other way. Would it not be a good idea to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? I'm not going to comment on the matter. And to abolish the amnesty law? You don't want to answer? It's not for me to say. In the end, all that Spain's stolen and trafficked babies and their mothers have to hang on to is the hope that DNA matching will succeed in reuniting their families. And the day has finally come for Ma, Manoli and Randy to find out the truth. I've spent a lot of time in recent months just sort of looking in the mirror and wondering, you know, who are you? Where, where do you come from? 
Are you completely Spanish? Are you half Spanish? Are you even Spanish? What, what are you? Every day that I've spent with them, we're studying each other, studying each other's mannerisms, studying the way we look. Today is a day beyond words, really. We love each other. We're comfortable together. He's looking for his family. We're looking for our boy, and everything is fine. That's it. Yeah. But of course, no. No. Pues estoy deseando llegar. I'm looking forward to getting there, and at the same time, I'm frightened. If the answer is yes, I'll never leave his side. I'll hug him, and no one will be able to separate us. I won't let go of him. I'll even go to Texas with him. How are you? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Es negativo. Mm. Es, no, no, las muestras no son compatibles. Te quiero igual. <laughs> Such an awful feeling, you know. They talked about it, the possibility that maybe very possibly Randy wasn't the son, the brother they were looking for. But when the result comes, that final result, and you see their faces, and you know their lives that were broken before just feel a little bit more broken now. And this is happening all over Spain, the same process, that same heartbreak. You know, it's upsetting. I mean, there's more doubt than I had before. It might be better just to lay all this to rest. You can't just say to yourself, I have to forget it, and that's it. It's with you for the rest of your life. I'm going to take some time out. I'm more relaxed thanks to the DNA bank. You can't do more than that. Of course, the search continues. If anything, this process has made me realize, and these people here have made me realize, that there's nothing stronger than your real family. Nothing. And I really believe in that. Jules welcomes back the Canadian singer songwriter Feist. Late Alive is next. Right, let's get on with something useful. Welcome to the Department of Penalty Studies. The 
Man Lab Space Funeral. I want to make the boiler suit a bit more.